Abigail Sewell, thank you so much for joining me. Um, you're a film and theatre director and you have recently started your own company called Uproot. Can you tell me what it is and what you hope to achieve with it? Yeah, completely. So, um, so Uproot Productions is a company that I've co-founded with the amazing Stephen Kavuma. Um, and it's a socially driven cross arts production company. Um, and we're here with the mission of supporting black artists. And how do you hope to do that? So we kind of want to adapt to whatever the, the need is, really, because we've obviously got our idea of what that looks like. And we've had some time to speak to various black artists about what they might need. But particularly in, um, in these current times, it feels like we need to really be responsive. Um, so that could look like creating pathways and creating first time opportunities, um, opportunities that have a form of structural support. Um, that could be something as simple as connecting black artists with industry leaders. Um, it could come down to something so simple as um, desk space or, you know, it, from, from the larger things that we need to the smaller day to day things. I think it's really just about um, listening and navigating whatever arises and, and, and trying to be clear and responsive with it. So for a young theatre, you know, performing arts professional like yourself who's wanting to build a career in the performing arts, how do you go about it? And is it harder for black artists generally to do that? I think that it's it's harder for artists because of many different issues. So that I think that we anyone with protected characteristics faces boundaries. So myself as as a black woman um, and as a young artist and being working class, I face barriers because of all of these. So um, like it, in terms of when we're looking to support out, um, black artists, we're really conscious that we need to be aware of, of artists' inter intersectionalities um, because we're, we are broad, we are vast. Um, and I think that in, specifically in terms of being black, I think there's, that race and class are, are interlinked. And I think that a lot of um, black artists face, um, working class artists generally face financial barriers. Um, and it, what, what the industry looks like for someone starting out is it often involves lots of unpaid work. And then that means that these pathways are available only to those who have a trust fund or have, you know, parents who are able to support, to support them financially, which is why we then start to get these these the storytellers that look the same or come from the same sort of privilege and so it's really important to ensure that funds and finances aren't a barrier for artists and then as well as that when you're telling a story as a black artist when you have predominantly white people as the gatekeepers white people often don't understand the stories that we're trying to tell or they have an idea of what blackness is or they want to hear a certain version of our narrative but we are like i said we are vast and we don't always fit into what anyone's idea of us is. And that idea is already built by the media, which is already flawed. So how do we go about tackling that? So let's look at that issue of gatekeepers. For, for somebody watching this who isn't an expert in the theatre world, what do you mean by a gatekeeper? So a gatekeeper is someone who basically holds the keys, someone who can offer you an opportunity, someone who makes decisions, somebody who holds the funds. Um, and so that could be um, an artistic director who does the programming, um, for instance. And, and I think that it, a gatekeeper, I mean, it, in a way, it's, 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 it, I think it often has negative connotations, but I don't think it necessarily needs to be that. So in, in a way, through founding Uproot Productions, where I'm going to be um, offering opportunities, in, in a way that makes me a gatekeeper. So it's just more about how you, how, how you work with that gate. Is that gate open? Are, are, is it accessible? But what are you doing to ensure access? Yeah, right, exactly. Do you think that your world of the theatre is changing for the better at the moment? Or has that process not started yet? I think that I don't have a um, broad enough view on like the, the history of theatre because I think it's really easy to look and be like oh look there's this there's change happening but often this change happens in a spike or there's like a moment of change like there was a time when we had like I think it was th two or three um, black plays in the in the West End and everyone was like oh it's amazing change but I mean obviously they're not there now because of Covid but like how is that sustained um, and I think 
I, I have my apprehensive apprehensions um, about the change that we see, um, particularly where with the recent um, wave of Black Lives Matter and the police brutality that we've seen, it feels like white people are suddenly waking up and I don't understand how. I don't, I, I don't believe it. And I think a lot of it is virtue signaling. Um, I think a lot of it is, I think, I think now for the first time, I would say, I, I mean, I, I really can't say for the first time because this is, this is in my lifespan, but sure. for the first time that I've seen people are being held accountable for racism in ways that they've been held accountable for other isms, but we haven't seen that for black people. Um, and so I think that now, if you don't make a statement, you're going to get cancelled or you're going to, do you know what I mean? Some, there's going to be a repercussion. So mm. um, I just want to ensure, you know, ch change, whether it comes from a, a place of real intention or whether it's change at gunpoint, change is change. So I just want to ensure that everyone who posted a black square, we see you. We see you. Uh, right. So let's say that you and and, and the people who are driving for change like you are, are successful. Let's look 20 years ahead into the, the theatre profession in the UK, assuming it recovers from COVID. What would you like it to look like in the future? So uh, it's interesting because I've had like a few conversations with Stephen as well. And um, it's funny, like in setting up Uproot, the, the ideal would be that Uproot ceases to exist because there's no need for it we're here because there is an issue if that issue is resolved then you know of course there's still there's still room for um for engines and organizations that tell specific sorts of stories but not there shouldn't be a need for organizations to tackle inequality like is is it not ridiculous that i as like a young black theater maker and steven as a young black theater maker are the ones who are putting our own time and our own money into this to strive for change when they're we're like why are we always the ones who have to be accountable and do the labor to create the change and it, it that is the way it is and we're here doing this because this is what we are passionate about and what we strive for um but i think you know i think a big a big issue in the arts is is rates of pay and expectations of um working hours so that's going to be a real thing to change um i think that the audiences are not reflective of our society. And I think that most of the people who work in theater or work in the arts generally will recognize the power of the arts. Like I for one have found theater to be incredibly healing and cathartic. And I think that it's criminal that it's predominantly white middle-class audiences that benefit from this. And when why is that, do you think? I think it's who feels like they belong. So the, I mean, there's 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 a few things. It's the it's the it's the price of tickets, and then it's who feels they belong, and that comes down to the stories that are being told. Often, when I speak to people who I know about theatre, they still have this idea of loads of white people running around in dresses, and I'm like, yeah, sure, like <laughs> that that exists, and like probably a bit too much of that exists. But there's, there's like there's stories about you too, and then like when they come, they're like, well, what? And I think like you don't see it because it's off West End um, a lot of the time. Like I remember when um, when Nine Night was in the West End, I loved it because like everyone that I knew was talking about it, like people who'd never been to the theatre before, and like they were like, what? This is for me. This is about me. There's my grandma. Um, so there's that. Um, and then there's also like this weird, like snooty policing of audiences, which I think is probably going to get worse with, um, with COVID. Um, Go on, tell me more about that. It's like when you go to the, like, it's, it's funny as well, because, you know, I, I find myself underestimated a lot, um, you know, for, for whatever reason, for whatever bias, people don't look at me and assume that I may have directed this show. But like, I've been in the show as, as, a, as the director, noting the performance or as the assistant director and then someone has turned to me to police me and be like shh or be like and it's like I'm not even I, I'm not even being loud I might be like writing with my pen or something and it's, it's like who do you think you are mm -hmm. but sometimes I really feel like white people feel like God gave them dominion of the earth because it's like it's, it's too often that like we're getting non-police who are becoming community support officers and nobody asked you nobody asked you what about education? Do you think that there is enough being done at school level 
mm. to break down those those boundaries and barriers that you mentioned a minute ago. Um, which boundaries and, and barriers? Well, that that it's not making it's not making the industry representative enough or accessible enough. I think what's what's interesting is that, um, and I'm making a generalisation here, um, that a lot of people f from minority eth minority ethnic backgrounds. Um, their families won't necessarily encourage them to pursue the arts um, and I understand the fear because it's not necessarily seen as the most stable profession and it isn't always mm. um, but I think that that is a, a, a false truth that is shared um, but I what is interesting is that I think middle class people value the arts in a way that working class people don't and again this is a real generalization but it's it, it like it generally in um in public schools in like you don't see like the arts are being cut there's not much um emphasis on it um and then in private schools you see like there's these like whole like i don't even know how to, to like to how to articulate it but the the, there's a real emphasis placed on the importance of music and the importance of even language and I think I think what it comes down to is when you have like your foundations secured then you're able to build upon that and like dream to like bigger things but it's like when you don't even have food on the table why are you thinking about art do you know what I mean yeah. I think that's the kind of um I, I think I think it's a it's a financial thing and it's a class thing um and I think that there's an issue in, in schools that that the arts are not valued enough. Um, and that's in terms of not so much like teachers directly, but the curriculum and what's encouraged. Um, but I also think as um, theatre makers that we should be doing more to ensure that the and I, it's not even just about the next generation of artists. I think if you're receiving government funding to put on your production, then any taxpayer should feel that they have a right to see your art and they, they don't right now. And so I think that we have, um, we have a responsibility to, to change that. And I think that outreach departments should be more central in organizations and not this kind of afterthought or the thing that gets cut first. Yeah. I want to ask you as well about being a young person in the performing arts. And it's a very difficult time for all professionals in the performing arts, but particularly so for young people, for lots of reasons to do with furlough and SEIWS and all of that kind of stuff. You obviously have a tremendous amount of get up and go and drive. Tell me about your friends and colleagues. How are they feeling at the moment? What's their mood? It's not good. <laughs> it's definitely not good. Um, I think that um, I'm fortunate enough to, to be in a position where... Um, work comes to me now um and I think that that has a a real like in in this time the I, well, the, 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 I think the issues are I was about to say twofold it's even more than twofold it's like anyone who started out in the industry in the past year just wasn't entitled to government support because they didn't have enough like um they, they hadn't submitted enough tax returns and I, like, I'm really worried about the new entrants and the people who like were just like knocking on the doors and hadn't had like quite got their foot in yet. Um, I think that there's the, there's the, there's a hunger, there's a hunger to tell stories. Um, but there's also, there's not even, there's not even, I think, I think what it is is that for, for black artists, like we're also weary because of Black Lives Matter and we're also weary because we're disproportionately impacted by coronavirus and I think that it's, it's difficult to comment on the general consensus but I think like I think for the most part my friends just want to work like we just want to get going and, and make it happen and I'm, I'm loving how imaginative people are being with their you know digital responses and I, the people were skilling up in other art forms um, such as like film and audio drama um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm seeing the fight, which I want to see. I'm, I think we need to see right now. That's good to hear. C can I ask you to give some advice? Can you give advice to people maybe a bit like me 
who recognize what you're saying about entrenched privilege and they want to do better and they want to do good and they want to be better people and maybe they've even tutted somebody in the theater in the past what can they do what what can they do to help positive change i think it depends on that person and their position like if you've got money hands over the cash <laughs> um uh, and i think it's also about like educating yourself like i i so like i'm not interested in in really like sitting down and having like too too many conversations to explain like like there are books for this there are you know there's so many different ways of of educating yourself and i think that i think that what we need to see is just a real a real acknowledgement of what that privilege looks like because I think there's a there's a resistance there's a resistance to accept privilege I, I think I think even racism like when people talk about um what racism is it's a difficult conversation to have because it's so it's so like it's so some of my my experiences with racism if I tell them to you like I, I often get the thing of are you sure that was because you're black and it's like, yeah, I am actually sure. I am actually sure. So sometimes it's, it's just um, maybe acknowledging that you're actually not quite going to understand this one. But if you do have, if you do have like your own um, protected characteristics, then maybe take that and look at, not, not that like our experiences are the same, like being black is the same as being queer. And obviously there's, there's different, there's different um, people can be many layers of things. But I think just, you know, if you're a woman, just, just take that, take that essence of what it feels like to be oppressed as a woman and understand how a man is not quite going to understand that. And I think, I think just really being prepared to, to be held accountable um, in, in whatever way that looks like and just making space. Um, I think for, 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 for a lot of um, black artists, the real issue that we face is being, is being considered a risk um and i think that that's proven to not be true like i feel like people love black stories like they're the they're they're human stories um and so you mean considered a risk in terms of programming putting it yeah. on in the theater yeah exactly exactly and i've seen um you know i've, I've kind of been try, trying to stay off social media um recently because like the way yeah it's a bit much um but I've seen conversations already where um, where theatres have announced their programming, where um, there have been conversations taking place and saying, "Oh, but you know, the the, the issue of why we've we've programmed all of these like classic plays by white men um, with like older white male directors is because our audiences don't know these black plays that you speak that you speak of," and maybe there's some so maybe there's an element of truth in that and they're not going to 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 sell as much but i think um it's that's just it's, it's a lame excuse it's a bit of a lame excuse like we're going to need to see something because i think now is a time where um, we could really take 10 steps backwards and it's a time when we can really like helpfully reimagine what things can look like and where you know things have been closed and people have had a time to actually paid time to think and plan um, you know, let's use that. Let's harness that. Yeah. So going back to the money, you mm -hmm. said hand over the cash. Does that mm -hmm. mean go to the theatre more, or does it mean donate to something? It means come to come to Uproot Productions. That's uprootprod.co.uk. You will see our PayPal. You will see our Patreon. We could do with the support. Just tell people what a Patreon is. <laughs> um, it's it's a it's a monthly um, commitment to to um, donate, and then you get like little privileges, like little care packages, and all of that. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> okay, now when the theatre's open, what will be the first uproot thing that people can go and see? That is classified information. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. We'll be on tenterhooks yeah. waiting to find out. <laughs> it's in the works. <laughs> fantastic. Abigail Seal, founder of Uproot Productions, thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you.